Welcome to Read Pop's Metaverse event, where we are breaking the fourth wall to bring convention entertainment to the comfort of your home. I am Victor Dandridge, the hardest working man in comics, and it is my immense pleasure to bring to you behind the scenes of Netflix original series, Tiny Creatures with Jonathan Jones, where we will be chatting with the acclaimed Emmy award-winning writer-director on his newest project, capturing the biggest adventures of some of Earth's smallest creatures. Jonathan, how are you? How are you doing today? I'm great. I wish I had your energy. But yes. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Um, I just got back from a shoot in Iceland and a little bit tired today, but, you know, rearing to go and love to, you know, talk to you about the show and hopefully get everyone excited about, you know, the crazy things that we've been up to because it is a very That's amazing kind of show. So, yeah, but no, I'm, I'm really good. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Are you staying safe and sane from the antics of the year 2020? Has it been affecting you at all? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously for everybody, it's been crazy. There's no question. You know what? We haven't actually stopped. So for us, it hasn't been perhaps as terrible as, uh, you know, some others. So we've kind of seen it as an, not an opportunity, but a way of keeping busy, looking at different things in a different way, having some time to think, which is, to mm. be honest, as a creative, you know, you struggle thinking because you're always into the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Just having that little pause kind of just makes you, you know, just have that little bit of time to, just think, okay, what is our next move? How do we, oh, that idea, now with an extra few days of creative time, wow, that idea is way more stronger now than it would have been. Oh, that's brilliant. So I love that. You, know, you just have to draw positives in everything. And, you know, everyone's struggling, and it is a crazy time. And it's something that nobody could ever have expected. But sometimes these things, you have to, you have to find the kind of brighter side of it and, you know, do, you know, spin it to your advantage. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you have a number of accolades, including a primetime Emmy for your work on Planet Earth 2 favorites uh but there was a genesis to your interest in film what was it what made you want to be a filmmaker and storyteller well i mean i've always been interested in imagery and i think probably for me imagery is is where it comes from i actually wanted to be a pilot if i'm really honest wow i'm not the most academic and i don't think i'm clever enough to be a pilot so um no that aside but i think even with pilots you know imagery and and you know landscapes it's always kind of captivated me and i've always had a love for the natural world um, just really like been into everything around me and I've always been like a bit of a question asker well, why is that like that and why you know why does that look like that and you know and obviously light is a huge part of you know what I'm into so I think from a really early age it's just been the thing that's been me to be honest that has I never really never really thought of doing anything else I mean when I was younger you know I had a film crew come to my primary school in the UK we have primary school like, like right. education and they made a film as it was a really drab film on education, but still seeing a crew, seeing lighting, seeing it was kind of like, and they were very, you know, open and allowed us the opportunity to, you know, have a play with the cameras and what does oh, the sound that's awesome. sound like through the microphones? I think it like, I was like five years old. I think wow. that, I, I really think that probably did play some kind of role. Um, but the fact that they were so encouraging and so, mm-hmm. you know, you know, like open, I think that, and that's something that I've tried to take going forward and everything we do you know just that's brilliant to, like you know share the knowledge kind of thing i love it now do you have a favorite movie is that possible as a filmmaker for you to have a favorite i don't know i mean i love i love i mean this is a cliche answer isn't it i mean i love films for so many different aesthetics like shawshank redemption for the storytelling yes private ryan for the opening action i remember seeing like that film for the first time and just i'd never seen anything like it of course you know all, i'm a huge star wars fan i mean like really a really, really huge i've actually got a full stormtrooper outfit just around the corner <laughs> i was gonna i did wonder whether i should put it on and wear it but no um, i mean we might have to stop this right now and have <laughs> you go do that just to see full regular i mean like are you part of the 501st like is that how hardcore we're going i've actually got somebody here in our office today who is that's amazing. So, so they are, and they they <laughs> custom made their outfit. Like my, mine wasn't that, but no, I think from from filmmaking, I think it's a bit like my taste in music. To be honest, mm-hmm. I kind of like don't. I, there's no one thing. Um, I don't particularly like horror films because I have I have a brain that's a bit too sensitive. So I actually okay. those things like play on my mind. Um, I've I've actually shy, I shy away from them because yeah, I I find that it takes me a few days to digest what I've seen. But like good performance, beautiful cinematography, and I think you there are like scenes within films that you can get right. that is incredible. That and you almost want to put them all together and make some odd genre, which is Oh my gosh. So yeah, That's so I like, I like I like like with music, I pretty much like every type of music and I pretty much like every type of film. Even like Bollywood, the visuals and the choreography, it's like there's right. something so incredible with that. 
you know, am I a huge Bollywood fan? Well, no, but I appreciate it. So, of course, yeah, it's always a tricky question. I get asked it quite a lot, and I think the answer really is well, I kind of like everything. I can see goods and positive and negative in everything, but good storytelling, I mean, good performance, I mean, that's everything, isn't it? And actually, some films that don't have a lot of CGI, where CGI is, you know, it's a part of the storytelling, it's not the storytelling. The accent, that is so important because that is just an effect. It is not the vehicle for telling a story. And that's what these things are all about is sharing that, that story. Yeah. And if you so break, they stick, break storytelling down to the simplest form. I mean, the best stories are basically we could tell each other around a campfire. And that well said. Kind of doesn't need to be any more than that. Obviously, if you right. have a few lasers and things. <laughs> a couple explosions <laughs> back there. A, that's a campfire story. But the point is it has to have a story and the story is king. Of course, of course. Oh, man, after my own heart, I love you for saying that. Um, I have a confession to make. So documentaries, to me, are one of the most innovative and intriguing vehicles for storytelling. What drew you to that genre? I think there's an honesty about it, um, documentary. And I think there's, oh, it sounds a bit wordy, but there's also an educational part to it, which is quite mm-hmm. interesting. And it's like, you know, fiction is great, but fiction can't, can change people but doesn't necessarily change people as well as a compelling documentary could do so i think i think you know i found my niche in documentary certainly with the natural history side of things Mm -hmm. and i think there's a you know i found working in like the you know the bbc led david attenborough narrated um things you know people seem to resonate really well with that which is fantastic but um but you know it's just it's just where I was at. But actually, my dream as a filmmaker is to make a movie. So I've, I've kind of like, you know, it's not that I'm in that one box and I want to stay in there. I kind of see it as a whole marketplace. And actually, the market is changing hugely. You know, TV is now, you know, serial drama is now commercial, is now feature. Right. It's kind of all the same, actually. So I think as a filmmaker, you know, it's like the, the creative possibilities at the moment are just are there and they're kind of there for the taking. And I think that's what's so incredible about the world we're in right now is that a, a, a classic documentary maker, you know, like myself, could actually make a feature. And that's mm-hmm. so exciting. I mean, especially in the world of streaming, which is now the newest phenomenon in terms of how we view content. Obviously, as a documentarian, how do you say that word? Doc- Whatever you want. <laughs> documentary <laughs> maker. That's what we'll call it. <laughs> um, as someone who does that, though, that's got to have uh, some impact on how you tell stories. You want to uh, make sure that people don't lose their interest, keep it fresh, the whole nine. So how has streaming affected how you create work? Well, I actually think it's made it more liberating because, you know, Netflix on this particular project we're going to talk about have been just a dream to work with. Like traditional television fits into a box very you know, you've got a schedule, you've got an ad break, you've got right. whatever it is. Well, it doesn't work like that on a streaming platform. It's like you watch what you want to watch when you want to watch it. So, right. you know, and even down to the fact that when you make a show for TV, every episode pretty much has to be exactly the same length, like frame for frame, you know, they're carbon copies. With Netflix, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, if you're, one episode is an hour long and another one's 50 minutes or wh- whatever, it's like, well, it doesn't matter because nobody's watching it because they know that after those 10 minutes is the next show. Right. So, so, and that's kind of like when you start to think about it. So, well, actually, that's incredible because, you know, now that, you know, what you tend to find is you make a show and some, some storylines are always stronger than others. That's the same with movies, you know, and you sort of end up, you know, to hit a certain time frame, you end up having to stretch it a little bit. And you can right. really feel a film that's had, you must have gone to the movies and gone, it was great, but it was like 15 minutes too long. Yep. Or, this, uh, or a show you've watched. It's like, wow, I kind of should have ended it before they did the next mission. <laughs> Um, and so with that, because it's kind of, you know, it's agnostic to frame rate, it's, it's not, it can be, kind of be like you could watch a 24 frames a second movie or a 25 frames a second, you know, TV show in mm-hmm. the same sitting. And it's, it's just really interesting. And I think and the fact that, you know, as a viewer, you know, you could, it depends what mood you're in, right? And the problem with telly, you sit down and you're like, well, I have to be in this mood because that's all that's playing. And now it's like, I'm in a funny mood. I'm in a sad mood. I'm, you know, it's just, it's just. It opens up a doorway and a gateway almost to, you know, to kind of sound worthy, but like endless possibilities of what you want to do. And I think no, from, I love it. Uh, from a filmmaker's point of view, to have your work on a platform that could go anywhere, and obviously with the scope to work on more and more shows that could go anywhere, I think it's just really exciting. That's fantastic. I, you work a lot with nature, and, and that's been like a heavy focus. What is it like when the actors that you're dealing with are people, things that you can actually direct or control? Um, how do you find like 
the, the, the story within all that and keep it authentic? What is, what is that like? Well, there's, there's, two, there's two walks to that, essentially. So you've got what we call blue chip natural history. So that's your planet Earth. Okay, so that is uh, absolutely observed animal behavior in the wild. And so that is, you know, you, you spend months and months, years, actually, I think it's you know, four years to make that series. Wow. Um, you know, and you have to be in the right place at the right time. And you've got all the factors like weather and all of those things play a huge, a huge, um, you know, sort of impact on what you're going to film. When you jump into the other side of it, like tiny creatures, for example, we, we are taking everything we know from that genre. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I just had some equipment fall over. Sorry about that. It's the <laughs> ghost of, of the studio. I think we can cut that out. I was like, sure, um, sure. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe not. That's uh, it's natural. Yeah, no, it's like, just keep it going. Somebody didn't, somebody didn't agree with what I said. Um, <laughs> so, so basically, yeah, when you, so to backtrack, to, so to when you work in something like Tiny Creatures, where you have, um, you know, we're taking everything we know from filming animals, observing them, understand, I mean, the key thing is understanding animals, mm -hmm. understanding what's going to work, what they like, what they don't like, what environments they like, etc. We take all of that. And the other half of the work that I do is drama and TV commercials. So I kind of like took all of that side of things and put them together. Um, but to answer your question, kind of sort of backtracking a little bit. Uh, maybe we should ask the question again because I lost my <laughs> Well, no, it's it's what's it like to try to capture the actors that you can't control? Like that's got to be tough. Yeah. So, so the answer to that question is is patience. You know, ultimately. So, if you want to mm -hmm. capture the leopard doing something or whatever, you we often go onto location. An average is a, you film for about um, five weeks for about four minutes of footage. That's wow. kind of how it equates. Okay. So you often find within that time period, you're there for long periods because the weather will go against you. Something will happen. There's all these things that will, you know, that will happen. And so you're learning and learning and learning. And often when you see those making of episodes, it usually says in the last minutes, they got, got the shot that they were after. And the reason for that is it's taking you four weeks to follow the animal, understand what it likes, understand what, it, you know, where it might go. And you are literally, you are out every morning for sunrise. You don't get back till sunset. You invest your wow. life and your soul into getting those fo that footage. And um, yeah, it usually does happen in the last week because you've learned what, it need, what you needed to do to capture that moment. That's and that's great. what makes it so kind of powerful when you do, you know, when you're filming it through the lens and the animal is doing what you're after, your heart is racing like you cannot believe. And you're, <laughs> you're, you get the shakes. And often when it ends, you kind of have a little bit of a moment where you're, you, you know, it's almost too much. And then the first thing you do is check you recorded it. Did I get it? Did because, I absolutely get it? Yeah, because the thing is, sometimes you look, that, you, you look down constantly like, yeah, it's recording, yeah, it's recording, yeah, it's recording. But all the time you're still focusing. So it's a, it's a real, a real, a real adrenaline. That is right. amazing. Okay. So from a behind the scenes sort of standpoint, is it that you are going with an intention of story and you, you know, hopefully get to capture it? Or is there an essence of where there's story that kind of builds itself as you're watching and you kind of build that yeah. narratively? I mean, there's two, there's two fold to that. So the first thing is again, talking about planet earth and the kind of uh, natural history approach to that. You always go out with an aim, and the aim might be that there was a science paper published on a piece of given behavior, or you know that at a certain time of year, this animal might travel through this. There's always, you always you're not just turning up going, oh, what should we film? You've got, <laughs> you've got a plan. But the thing, what happens again, over those sort of four to five week periods, you'll, you'll realize that actually, um, you might capture something that you never knew you would ever get. And so you could capture, you know, incredible pieces of, animal behavior and obviously on the ground then you then go well actually that's we could never have written if we'd have written that into the ambition it would never, never happen it would so we've got that now right so now it's like okay so now what's the story and, and it's quite many times you know my experience is just completely changed or you might have like a, a weather element might come in like the lightning might come and set the place on fire i mean things like that have happened yeah. and it's like oh right well, we have to build this into the story so you are you have a plan but you are also incredibly reactive to what you see. So it's like fun. improv movie making. It is, it is really because you just don't know. All you know is that you go there with the ground and field skills to do the best you can and you right. take equipment that you preempt will be the resources that you need. But you're kind of at the mercy of mother nature, which is what oh makes it goodness. so exciting. That is amazing. Now, okay, we're supposed to be talking about tiny, I'm sorry? Uh, animals don't hit marks. <laughs> 
They and don't, I, right? Like that's the, I mean, but you sometimes make it look as though they do. And we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Um, Cause even though we're supposed to be talking about tiny creatures, which you guys can watch on Netflix now, as you're watching this, um, I have to admit, if I don't talk about planet earth to specifically the Island episode, like liter iguana versus the snakes that was the most exciting feature i don't care how short it was the most exciting feature of the year you can put any superhero movie against it i was in there i felt the iguana how how did you do this how did that come together well i personally didn't film that i was involved in that sh that show but i didn't personally do it you didn't do that one no. lie tell everyone that you did uh, i'm no, okay I, with I, that I, I couldn't claim it, but I, oh, I, man. I was, uh, there was a discussion that I would be on that shoot, but it didn't work out. But anyway, oh, that's, but that's what I'm happened. Heartbroken. It's all about, you know, because the dates and calendars are always moving and, of and course. when the fronts come in, you know, I was actually on a different shoot for the same program while that one was on. So it's Got like, you. everything's moving. So you're always like watching the, the tides if you can get into a place or right. sometimes there's political things are happening in countries that you have to be so careful with. I understand so, that. You know, often it's like your calendar days align and it just with that one, it didn't work out. But no, I mean, it's amazing. And I think what, what people love in, in storytelling is being like being on the shoulder of an animal and feeling something about its perilous journey. Um, because you want to root for those things. And if you, of if, if, if a scene that makes you sit on the edge of your seat, well, that's pretty compelling. And that's what we've done in Tiny Creatures. Oh my God. That's the thing that I'm most excited about, seeing the different visuals of, of being these, these animals. I mean, we all get stories growing up of personification where you know the animals have these human traits, but you are literally putting us in their field of view and we are them and they are us and it's, it's perfect. Like, yeah. this is better than live action Disney. Yeah, exactly. And I think for Tiny Creatures, you know, it's funny, when you're in location and you're filming animals for a long time, you actually end up, put, I, I personally do, maybe it's just my silly brain, but I end up putting like human voices on them because sometimes you can be sat there for months and not, you know, you're on your own, it's raining and you're like, oh, here he comes. Do you <laughs> start putting human voices in it and they start talking to each other and it's like, because it keeps you sane. Of course. It's kind of like, you know, Tiny Creatures for me, I wanted to take what I knew of filming traditional blue chip natural history. So the storytelling is sound, you know, the, the science is there. But I wanted, to, I wanted to make a series that engaged, it actually engages a slightly younger audience. It's, it's basically family viewing, right? Mm -hmm. But I was keen that, you know, sometimes to get um, a, an audience, a younger audience to watch Our Planet on Netflix or BBC Planet Earth 2, you know, it's quite a jump because it's quite a grown up show, actually, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of its narrative. And, and so I think what Tiny Creatures does is it, it serves brilliantly as an entry level into this natural history genre. So it's a bit fun. It's you know, it's a bit silly in places, but actually it's rooted on fact. These animals don't do anything that they, they wouldn't do. Okay, so that's, that's really important. But what we've done is we've put some anthropomorphical dialogue into them. So we put human, human emotions. So we tell the audience that they're feeling sad or they're feeling scared. Um, all the things that, as a viewer, we would probably do anyway. So the right. iguanas and the snakes, you feel scared for that <sighs> little guy. I did, and you feel I did. Like the snakes are the baddies. It's actually really simple storytelling. So right. that's kind of what we've done. It's like, so when the, one of our animals and tiny creatures is being chased, you feel like, oh my goodness, come on, get away. You can do it. And I wanted to also tell the story of the animals that you don't really see every day. So there's a whole like power struggle going on at our feet that you don't really like, don't see. Even notice. You, see it, you see it on lions on the Mara or whatever, you know, they're amazing, beautiful animals, but there's a smaller stories to be told. And those stories are pretty compelling. That's amazing. Oh my goodness. Okay, so Tiny Creatures uh, is a feature from Ember Films, which is your production company. Um, yeah, and, co it, and we have some uh, some partners in there as well. We have uh, Momentum and Blackfin as well, uh, working awesome. with us on the project but with Netflix. Yeah, but we, uh, Ember, we uh, wrote it, directed it, shot it, you know, et cetera. That is so awesome. And it's narrated by Luke Cage himself, Mike Coulter. Uh, how did that particular project come to bear? Was it just kind of that carryover of, you know, the Planet Earth 2 stuff? And you're like, I have more stories to tell in this medium. Or was there something else that sparked it? Was it a science piece, research? What, what sparked that one? Well, I mean, I think uh, the bottom line of it is I'm a big kid at heart, right? So I love kids. That? That's my favorite genre. Um, we were trying to get an idea off where we were pitching to another broadcaster and we were kind of being, we were kind of making something that was a little bit more like a mini planet earth, 
Mm-hmm. And it was like, it was good and it was exciting. But um, through, through agents that we have, basically, um, we got an opportunity to present it to Netflix. And um, I actually changed what we were p- presenting because I knew that, you know, because Netflix wasn't a traditional broadcaster, we didn't have to be traditional. Right. So, so we, uh, you know, changed the wording, changed the creative style, changed the visual language, and we pitched them this kind of um, this idea. And what was so brilliant is that um, Amy at Netflix, the executive, was kind of embraced it. I think she also loves kids' films and was awesome. excited about the photography language that we were trying to make. So we, there were two kind of, for me, there were two very distinct dialogues in this show. One was the spoken word of Mike Coulter, Luke right. Cage, and the other was the the, the the narrative language of the cinematography because they both were synergy like they were the same thing it's like of course you know it all you, you could say something but you needed to see it and, and i wanted to put the camera on the shoulder of these animals so not that you were seeing it from afar you were li- next right there you're right in amongst it and oh man and i think so it's almost like going back to that what you were saying before about the snakes and iguanas it's like it's that kind of thing but all the time <laughs> <laughs> now what i don't know for this one is is there a soundtrack because i can't even imagine the fun of trying to put something together orchestral like to, to match what you're seeing visually like that's yeah. got to be amazing so i have a good friend of mine a composer called ben squires um right from the off i was like right ben we're gonna do this and and uh his music is uh, theatrical. He does like big the- uh, theatrical trailers, like How to Train Your Dragon and all this kind of stuff. That's awesome. Um, and uh, we, I've worked with him for many years and I knew that I wanted this score to be very classic. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was like, you know, this is a movie. This is like a theatrical piece so that when, you, you, you know, how better to create uh, audience emotion than that kind of crescendo of classical score and then the release of that you know, the horns, da, 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 you know. Oh my God. You know? And so um, he's, he's written a beautiful, beautiful score, all un- all custom composed. It's, um, yeah, he's done a great job and he's really brought it to life. And we have a beautiful theme tune for it as well, which that we always do, so, like a hero film. But for me, like all these animals are like mini heroes. They're all superheroes. They all actually have, they all actually do generally have superhero quality. Of course, of course. You know, the mouse, uh, a female mouse passes uh, navigational map skills skills to her babies before they're born through DNA. It's like, wow. hang on a minute, that's, that's cool. cool. Um, you know, uh, squirrels that can fly, you know, right. by stretching out their wings and, you know, and in that particular episode, the, the squirrel doesn't know she can fly until she uses it later to actually leap from the snake, which is in the little... Oh, and I saw that in the trailer. It's so yeah, amazing. Yeah, exactly. So, so, yeah, I mean, for me, I'm a huge sound advocate. Like, I mean, I always get that you know for, so go back to planet earth 2 Hans Zimmer doing the score it's like incredible to have David Attenborough narrate your footage and Hans Zimmer do the score it's like well that's yes. pretty amazing <laughs> um, and it does whenever I, I hear, whenever I hear good music I always get goosebumps you know and that's something that so for me I kind of bring sound right in at the beginning it's like so what is the tone what is the what is the emotion that we're trying to create here and that's, that's why beautiful. I've always been into that. You know, that's I love that. About. So that, that, that shows that you're a well-rounded storyteller because you recognize that music is a part of the story. It's a part of the atmosphere, the mood setting, all of that in order to immerse the viewer, which is fantastic. The other thing that you're really playing around with that's amazing is the use of technology and how we can capture things. Now, you mentioned that the camera back there captures a thousand frames, was it? Yeah, a thousand frames at 4K, 4K DCI. That is amazing. What other fun gadgets and toys have you gotten to play with on this creative adventure? Well, I think I can perhaps talk about where it comes from. So like okay. my background, I was uh, an online editor originally. So okay. I come from post. So I really understand like really complex workflows in from film into digital. Um, I was then a cinematographer working on, and then obviously I, I now direct a lot, but I often shoot and direct at the same time. So I mm-hmm. don't do it separately because a lot of the things I direct are um, quite technical, challenging uh, things that can only be done if you completely understand the photography because right. it's almost exactly the same brain. It's like setting up the shot, lighting it, building the sets that we'll do. If you didn't understand exactly what it's going to look like through the lens, it would almost be impossible. So, and we, and that's got to be easier to translate because you're not having to tell someone you're exactly. just doing it, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, tiny creatures. Um, 
it has a whole list of first times for anything. So wow. that's kind of like, I can talk about that from a technical point of view. So, so we, we, um, unlike a planet earth, you might do some storyboards for planet earth, but obviously they're not because you don't know what you're going to film. Right. It's more like, wouldn't it be great if we got this shot and wouldn't it be lovely if we got that? It's like, but obviously we might not. What we did for the tiny creatures is we pre-visualized every single frame, but more importantly, we pre-visualized it, but it was pre-visualized accurately. So every frame we drew, was the frame that we were going to shoot. So I drew them really badly. I call them my crapomatic. <laughs> and I've got a great guy who, um, Andy, who uh, spent so much time, uh, you know, uh, drawing them, bless him, he was working so hard. But, um, you know, every single frame was accurately drawn. So what we did is we edited the whole show before we even turned on the cameras. And that uh, animatic, as we called it, was sent right. to the composer. So we were, we were listening to score before we'd even shot a frame. Oh, wow. So that when we, were draw, when we were shooting, the score was coming in and we were like, we'd send uh, Ben uh, like a piece of a, a clip, like we got this amazing shot. And he'd go, oh, right, well, hang on, I can do that, you know. And so it was this kind of really organic, like creative process. But what we actually did with Netflix is we got them to pretty much sign off the show before we shot the show. Wow. So that we could start looking at script. We could start, because... You know, like I said before, about five months for about four minutes. Okay? Right. And we shot um, the whole, e each episode for Tiny Creatures in 27 days. Wow. And so, that is intense. Yeah. And, and not only that, we also ran post-production at the same time as the shoot. Oh, my God. So at the end of the last day of filming, the first cut was done with score. Wow. So it's okay. pretty insane. Okay pause that's a game changer okay like you're like the the scale of production of that and and for anyone that's watching like you have to understand that when you're making any sort of feature um, long form or not like there's a lot of hands involved and it takes time so to do that in under 30 days that has got to be mind-boggling level of exhaustion you were on after that was what yeah it was pretty it was pretty well to add an extra curveball into that at one point we made two at the same time oh my goodness <laughs> wow okay i'm okay i was a fan before i'm thoroughly impressed right now that is insane that so is i would insane. Um, i would do my pre-prep so we would have like five episodes roughly in production at the same time and i would do my writing with Gemma, who's a co-writer um where i'd be looking at pre uh, the the um the animatic process on one or two shows writing and visualizing getting the language going that i talked about before. right having shooting one directing them and then in the evening doing that kind of exec producing stuff with america so it was like <laughs> yeah yeah no that's what? do you have superpowers do you no, want to reveal no. that right here i mean you can my, my only superpower is i i can function with not much sleep <laughs> <laughs> i respect that i absolutely so, respect that you know all, all these things aside you know what, what was so brilliant about the show is the fact that you know netflix gave full trust in us you know often they would question things like why is we doing why is it like this or what like that but you know they, they always we, we would just we always had an answer because everything had an intention so right you just talk to them and go well ah that's because of this or that oh right cool great nice. well, we trust you. and it was actually a dream collaboration because they that's pretty awesome. much trusted us to do because it was so different you know it wasn't like a documentary it wasn't right. like a movie it was like a hybrid of uh, you know i don't know and it was like well we just trust you to make it and it was so awesome and then oh, also to have mike coulter in there as well then to add his tones which is just amazing and he was a dream to work with that's awesome so oh. in terms of technical side you know your right. original question all that time ago I no, no, no 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 this is this is amazing um, is you know we were talking about technology i mean we actually recorded the last vo session with mike um it whilst lockdown was on Oh, and wow. so, so we got him some special microphones and he recorded it to his iPhone in his child's closet. And we were doing a Dolby Atmos record session for, for, wow. you know, for the master. And the, that VO session took six and a half hours to, for him to record. Because every time he would draw a page of script, he needed to upload it from his iOS device. Exactly. Oh, and so, wow. and, and I tell you, he was a trooper and just an absolute dream to work with because he was so invested in the project. And you know, there's not many people, the talent out there that was be up for that and so very true a huge amount of respect for mike he's such a lovely guy that's amazing um, he's the next morgan freeman of voice guys i can see it <laughs> yeah <laughs> always, oh and his his you know he he responds brilliantly to direction and you know i was very keen for tiny creatures that the, the you know the vo wasn't a vo it was a right. story. And that's so, perfect kind of 
you know, the only limitation we had was we did have limited time with him. I mean, I could probably record with him all day just to try and get those little. You know, <laughs> Let me get some more. Just a little more. Just need a little more. Yeah, and, I'm um, out of that. You know, but he was he was good. But I mean, in terms of keep talking about you know like technology. I mean, we shot most of the series in 8K. Um, that was a big thing for us because we needed to have that scope to use the resolution to our advantage because sometimes right. the animal might not go where we wanted it to go or we might just have that canvas space to play around with. Um, obviously, it's delivered in 4K. Um, but the bigger, the, one of the biggest factors of Tiny Creatures is the fact that no two animals are ever together on set. Really? Oh, so, so we shot, in essence, not only did we do it in 27 days and all this crazy stuff, we actually shot everything twice. So, That's insane. Yeah. So if you had like a scene where an an, a mouse was running, like right. this, we shoot that part and then we make the animals completely safe. It's all like safe. And then the owl comes in and, oh. then, and then you basically put the two together. So when the shots are together, it looks like they're. Thank you for telling me that. So I can make sure that my daughters know, because I, I know that they're like, daddy, this is dangerous. The mouse almost died. Like this will, this will, I'll be like, Hey, listen, I know it's the guy. Huge, it's cool. A huge part for this show is actually, you know, we treated all the animals as if they were A-list celebrities. I mean, they were our talent. They were our actors. That's amazing. And, you know, we worked with some of the best animal uh, specialists in the world. Mark Amy, the guy who's head animal wrangler for this, he's just, I mean, he's, he's, he's up there. He's one of the best, well, he's the best in the world. You know, there's a handful. That's amazing. And, you know, I would, I've worked with Mark for about 10 years. And we would, we would work on the shots and we'd try and figure out like what was the best thing we could do for the animals. And often the animal would go from A to B. So often the animal is actually just doing that. But we turn all the sets around all the time. So it looks like they're doing multiple angles. But it means we nice. have to basically rebuild the set nearly every shot. Oh, wow. So it's and you really, still managed to do this within 30 days. Yeah, it's like, really, it's full on. It's full on. Everything that you're saying just makes that feat even more, you know, of a, of a gigantic Herculean oh. feat. Like, it doesn't make sense that this was possible. Well, one, one animal that we filmed was the flying squirrel, which is the only flying squirrel outside of North America. So, we, um, but it has to be filmed within an enclosure because they're so fast. Right. They're like, you know, you know, they're, they're gone. gone. So, um, every single frame was filmed with uh, a way that it could travel from its house to its house. And nothing. These like uh, mesh around it, safe mesh, so that it couldn't run away. Or you know, right. often we would we would work with the animals when it, when they wanted to be fed. It was like their feeding time, so we worked out when they liked to do it. So obviously, if they were sleeping, of course we would. Right. Of course. But they would come there and they would go there for the food, and that would be great. And if they weren't ready, and this is the other thing we had to always have on our, up our sleeves was if the animals were not feeling it for whatever reason, because they, you know, we're never going to push them around. If they're of not, course. Like, it's kind of a bit like playtime, really, is the way I describe it. Right. If they weren't ready to play, then we had to move on to something different. So you always had to have not only what you were filming, you had to have almost like a backup uh, thing. That's you like weather cover almost on a drama. Yeah. Movie. Did you have a favorite animal that, that you love to work with the most? I think some of the birds of prey, uh, just beautiful. I mean, actually the ravens we had for the Florida episode and the um, episode one, uh, sorry, um, Texas episode, it was originally episode one. It's not now. You know, Got you. Um, so clever, you know, super intelligent. You know, we, there's a scene in the Florida episode where it flies in and it has to work out how to open a series of boxes. Right. You see an animal do that. And it's so clever. Um, oh yeah. You know, that's, that's brilliant. And they're just, and they, you, you know, they, they can stop and they can look and you can, they're so, so beautiful. Um, I love it. But every animal to be honest had its own characteristics. It had its own, thing that made it so unique. And I think that's what I'm trying to do with tiny creatures is just give them their time really. Just because they're small doesn't mean they're not impressive. Well played. Yeah, that's that's important to be said because too many people can overlook things on the basis of their size and not recognize the entire world that you're getting ready to show us, which is awesome. Yeah. What is one of your favorite unscripted moments that you've caught on film? Oh, I don't know. Well, that's a spin. Uh, unscripted in, in tiny creatures or in be as, as open with it as possible so you can tell us as much as possible i'm just trying to think what we what we, we could have done i mean uh i mean i think there, i think one of the moments that if we talk about tiny creatures we, we always had the ambition that the barn owl in the texas episode you know they're quite flighty they're quite tricky mm -hmm. um, 
but we managed to get it to not only fly where we wanted it to fly, but just in a fat, it's a, so it's a white owl, okay? Right. And when you shoot on a, a Phantom Flex, which is the camera behind me, um, its dynamic range is very limited. So its, di its steps between white and black is actually quite limited. And so a, a white owl lit in a dark space at a thousand frames whilst being chasing an owl. It's like, there's a lot of complications in there. And I always, you know, we had it in the script and I was always like, I knew this was gonna challenge photography massively. But when we first started to see that working, and those shots are incredible. They are so beautiful. Awesome. You can see it just gracefully. Oh. I mean, it's the ultimate silent predator. I mean, it's right. just, we kind of nicknamed him the angel of death, although his name was Barney. He's super cute. But, um, but, you know, on camera, it's like, you know, if you're a mouse, it's like this huge, I mean, imagine if you're that small. And right. this owl is enormous flying at you. You can't even hear it coming. because it's silent. Right. Oh. It's, it's the ultimate superhero, angel of death. That's but then in, later on in the story, we realized that she's the owl is actually just a mother who's trying to feed her babies. And it's all about circle. Circle of life, man. That's what it is. Like, there are no villains in the natural world. There are just that's people. Right. That alive. And I think that's, that's a really poignant story. And every kind of um, every strand of every episode kind of comes back to that notion. And we touch on it just delicately about coexistence. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. Uh, going back to Ember Films, is that a vertically integrated production studio? Do you have every facet of it covered or do you still have to farm things out? No, so we, we're end to end. So basically what we do is we, we, I think it's the only way you could bring a project like this to life. And actually we do that a lot on our commercial side. So, you know, when we're working with brands or, you know, whatever, we're, it's always about trying to find the end goal and then kind of working back from it. Same mm -hmm. with my creatures. I knew what I wanted to make visually and photographically and then we kind of work back well how would we achieve that how would we do that in post how would we do that from previous how would we do it you know from the animal welfare point of view right. so anyway you if you if you were working with multiple departments it, uh, you know external it just wouldn't work because one break of communication could actually cost the whole show well, so everything right it was a synergy between the great team that we've got here and the kind of vision that fed with the photography that fed with the equipment but fed with the way we moved the camera which fed with the post which fed with the visualizer it was literally it. it was almost like it was completely organic and i know that sounds pretty cheesy but actually it, it's um it's quite true because you know the the frames that we drew are the frames that are in the film that's fantastic that's, that's the that's the, the the key thing that made it possible Oh my goodness, that's that's so cool. And, what and like behind me, you know, we can pick the cameras up. We can use the light. It's all here, and that's right. It. So you know, um, and everything we've bought over the years that we own is all very, you know, it's the same. We own the same cameras that we did Planet Earth with. We own, you know, it's nice. all that. It's all you know, tried and tested equipment, and we all know as a, as a team how to use it and how to use it effectively. And what we do, the way we run our company, which is very different, is rather than having lots of individuals that do lots of individual jobs. We've tried to train our team to be really multi-skilled. To so, overlap. Yeah, so if we were doing drone, for example, it's not just a drone person. That drone person is also capable of shooting or you know, or a, somebody who's a lighting technician is also really versed in set design. So because we actually had a small, really tiny set design team on it. You know, it came out of my brain and through right. great communication and great relation, actually more importantly, relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah, to kind of go, yeah, that's exactly what we're after. Well, let's oh, change man. that. Let's quickly, you know, figure that I out. Mean, you, you obviously wear a lot of hats creatively, so that versatility speaks well for your team to have that same feature and for you to build that in your team. That speaks highly of you as a director. I'm, I'm impressed by that uh, <laughs> oh, completely. Please. What other projects are on the horizon for you? We've got, it's quite an interesting time at the moment. Unfortunately, that there's some I can't talk about, but um, we <clears throat> just got back from Iceland on a right. On and I can't say anything. I can't, say, but it's it's gonna when it comes out in a couple of years time. I mean, bear in mind it's a couple of years. Right. I think it's gonna be. You're gonna want to do a podcast on it. Oh, I'm excited. Um, okay. It's, um, it's big. It's got some incredible names connected to it. That's amazing. It's, um, I'm really. You know, projects come around, and some of you. I mean, obviously, tiny creatures is different because it's our baby. Of course. Grown. But obviously, we're we you know we work for so many. We're so fortunate that we work with so many different producers and you mm -hmm. know, productions. Um, but sometimes some come around that you're actually genuinely excited about, and that's one of them. So it's yeah, it's going to be cool. And I, oh, I, I can't wait. Companies. Oh, okay. Pins and needles. I'm feeling it. I'm yeah. feeling it. <laughs> now, obviously, we're going to have a lot of people that are up and comers in the film business: cinematographers, directors, writers. 
what's one piece of advice that you would share with them to kind of get them further along uh, in their journey? I mean, I think personally, when I started out, uh, you know, I, I wanted to shoot. I wanted to be, you know, I was, I was doing post and post back then was like tape to tape editing. You know, you, right. make a mistake, you could only make a mistake two or three times before you had to start your whole edit again. Right. In terms of filming, it was, it was film. So Super 16 film. Um, the big thing I think that's a challenge for people entering the film business is it's so accessible now. You know, everyone's got a, a mobile device that has right. a camera on it. But that, so what we've got to make sure is that there's no excuse, you know, and those that will succeed and those that try, you know, the best rule of creativity is to try and fail, but not be afraid to try. Yes. And if you want to make a film, I think what happens now is everyone goes, well, I haven't got the latest whatever. It's like, do you know what? That doesn't matter because if, you're a, if you've got an idea and if the idea is, even if the idea isn't well executed, but the idea is really solid, I think that's the future of everything. So I think... Technology, everyone's got the tech now. So actually right. the currency is the ideas. And the, the, it might be a script. It might be, you know, it might just be a really different way of filming. I mean, I, I mean personally, I, I mean, I'm, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm not actually a huge fan of film school. Uh, and the reason I'm not is because, you know, somebody teaches you, that you, it's, you need to know the science of photography, right? Right. That's physics, okay? Because you can only push that so far before right. it says no. <laughs> um, but in terms of teaching somebody composition, teaching somebody how they should like something, it's like right. those that are going to make their path or their their you know going to make the water ripple are those that don't do what everyone else does. Exactly. And now you've got the opportunity to experiment. I mean, you could have Adobe Premiere, you know, on your machine for nothing, essentially. Right. And a camera that you even if you could spend like. $500 or so you've got a camera that's pretty amazing you know it was certainly better than the film cameras that we were using <laughs> and so absolutely like, you know I think the, the only other thing I would my, my advice so my advice would be don't don't let don't not do it just get out right. there. Shoot, right. shoot, shoot. and the only way you're going to learn is to make a, a raft of mistakes and actually some of those mistakes will be the best things that have ever happened to you and Very some true. of those mistakes might actually become your style that's brilliant. Um, and the other thing I was going to say, and I just went out of my head, but the other thing was going to be, yeah, so don't, don't, you know, just go for it. Oh, my brain's just gone dead. I, was I mean, that happens. I know. It, you'll catch up. You'll, you'll message us later and we'll be like, oh, yeah, of course. That's a, I agree with that 100%. But I mean, just to, to, to just do it. Straight. Sorry, the other thing I was going to say was, um, is if you, you know, be honest about your skill set, because mm -hmm. one thing that we get a lot of people who want to work with us as a company. And, you know, if you've graduated from Phil College, you're not a DOP. You're not a right. director. You need you're graduate. to understand that you, there is a process to, um, yes, you may have directed a short film, but that is, and this is not trying to sound condescending or right, in right. any way. It's, you know, and also, because if you're looking for work, people aren't going to want to hire a director. They've probably got a director. They right. want somebody who's dependable who is going to turn up on time, who is nothing is too much trouble. You need to make yourself, if you want to get into the film business, like the producers or the production company can't function without you. Mm -hmm. Once you're in and you show that you have the right passion and you have more importantly, the right attitude skill set is actually irrelevant because if you're, if you've got the right energy and the right positivity and the right thing that makes you tick, Right. You learn from the people you work with. And That's you right. You climb that ladder quicker than anyone who says they're the best at what they do. I mean, I've never filmed anything that I've been happy with. Uh, so, wow. Because you, you do. You, you go on location and you, you, you know, it might just be that I know a lot of my friends who are in the same natural history game as, as I am are the right. same, actually. So it's a certain type of people where it's like, you know, you, you, you sort of go to sleep going, oh, funny, I'd move the camera over there. Or if only the, you know, the light came out at just the right time, but we were, we'd already put the drone away and you sort of kick yourself and you're like, you know, that you can always do something else. And I think that it's that kind of frustrated creative energy that makes you keep pushing forward and oh, never absolutely. be complacent. So to wrap it up, I think it's, you know, in that, with that question, I think it's, it's there for the taking. If you want it, bad, there is nothing to stop you apart from yourself. Oh my goodness. And on that note, that is the perfect way to end it. Uplifting, encouraging. 
Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing your time, talent, experience with us. Uh, I'd like to thank ReadPop uh, for bringing us together as our host. They are fantastic. Uh, make sure you are checking out Tiny Creatures streaming now on Netflix. I'm Victor Danders, the hardest working man in comics, saying thank you to all of you fans for watching. This has been Metaverse. Check it out.